Good day, everyone. Let's get started uh, pretty much right away now. Uh, as you know, I have a habit of uh, having a number of verses to, to get through. And uh, usually when I see uh, time uh, running towards an end or when our limit is usually up, I begin to, to rush a little bit. So I will uh, try and stay focused on what we're looking at. Uh, I won't promise you anything, uh, but I will uh, do my best. But uh, as you are uh, aware, we have been looking at the attacks uh, on the Holy Scriptures. And uh, we have been specifically looking at the attacks that come from the New King James Version. So over the past uh, few lessons, we have been looking at examples where the New King James Version uh, attack uh, Bible truths or Bible doctrines found uh, in the Word of God. And we've used John 17, 17 uh, as our guide, where the scriptures say, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So hence, we've looked at examples where they've attacked the truth, meaning the word of God. And then we're going to be heading in the direction where, they, where the New King James Version then actually attacks the truth, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ, just like we did with the New International Version. And as you, as you have seen thus far, uh, it's it's not just um, a one particular uh, teaching or doctrine over here that the New King James attacks or another one over, over, over here or just uh, one specific one. There's a majority. There's been uh, uh, teachings or historical uh, accounts there in the Old Testament where they've made a mess of things. And then as we've uh, run through some uh, New Testament uh, references as well, uh, you have seen that uh, they uh, attack those those teachings. And uh, this book, the New King James Version, cannot be trusted. And uh, we've seen thus far that, yes, it is a satanic version. And uh, we, we say that because uh, there is another spirit that's behind it. And we, we've already made mention before that that, uh, that root of that spirit ultimately comes back to, to Satan, just like he attacked the words of God there in the garden. And we uh, looked at those three characteristics of Satan, that firstly he causes uh, or brings doubt upon the words of God. He defiles the word of God by either adding to the word or subtracting to the word. We've seen the New King James Version do that. And then thirdly, we see that the devil deceives concerning the word of God. And he did that in Genesis chapter 3, where he mixed truth, God's words, with error, uh, forcing his own words or um, uh, uh, changing the complete uh, uh, truth that was being taught there in Genesis chapter 3. And again, we've seen that take place in the New King James Version. And we'll continue to see examples of that as we look at these references here uh, in today's lesson. Now, before we start into today's lesson, why don't you turn to the Gospel of Luke and this came to, to thought this past week because this past week, I believe it was on the on the Tuesday, was the 16th of November. And you may say to yourself, well, what was the significance of the 16th of November? Well, <clears throat> anyway, 
on my on my watch obviously it gives the gives the date like most watches and and, and uh, over here in australia where we had the date correctly written unlike in other countries around the world um in, in the united states of america where they have the date written uh, back to front whereas here in australia we have it uh, the correct way just like in the united kingdom as well so on that tuesday it was the 16th of november the 16th of the 11th month so on my watch throughout that whole day it said 1611 so a constant reminder to me of what of this uh, authorized version because when was the authorized version first published it was published in 1611 so i, I thought that was pretty neat there on uh, tuesday uh, this past week that it was the, the 16th of november uh, 1611 so i've dubbed that king james day okay <laughs> so next year on uh, november the 16th i'm going to wish you all if i remember and i trust that i do happy king james day because I've dubbed that uh, King James Day 1611. And I was reading through the Gospel of Luke uh, this past week. And interestingly uh, enough, if you look at Luke chapter 16 and look at verse 11, just have a look how your Bible is put together. And again, you can see God's hand upon this. Because is, it, is there any coincidence that we have uh, this, uh, this verse here in Luke 1611 with it being 1611 when the authorized version was published? Uh, have a look at it uh, with me. We read uh, over here, yes, Luke 16, 11, it says, If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you your trust the true riches? You know, where do we find those true riches? We find those true riches not in a New King James Version, not in a New International Version, for a practical application for us, where are you going to find those true riches on how to live the Christian life, on future events that are going to take place uh, in this world, uh, those uh, those teachings uh, about uh, heaven, those teachings uh, about hell, those teachings about Jesus Christ. You are going to find those true riches in the authorized version. And I thought that was pretty neat there in Luke 16, 11, where it says, If therefore ye have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, it says, Who will commit to your trust the true riches? You have uh, a book right in front of you, which is uh, uh, filled with uh, all sorts of uh, spiritual riches found here on in. And they're described here as the as the true riches. So I thought that was a pretty neat uh, practical application there. So just uh, keep that thought in mind. Every 16th of November, just remember Luke 16, verse, uh, verse 11. All right, let's get uh, into our study now as we uh, look at these attacks. We finished up looking at uh, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Remember, the thought there was about being crucified with Christ, and it's something daily that we need to, to put into practice Daily, we need to die to self and die to sin and make sure that uh, Christ is uh, living through us. Whereas the New King James Version teaches it's a one-off event. And no doubt that probably uh, gives the indication that it happens at salvation. And then after that, uh, you don't need to do that. But uh, once again, as you've experienced uh, uh, living the Christian life this week, I'm sure you've had to uh, be crucified with Christ and, and, and die to self. And uh, we're going to continue that sort of thought here when you look at the book of Ephesians. So go to Ephesians chapter chapter number four and have a look at what uh, the scriptures say in, in verse number 22. Ephesians chapter four and look at verse 22. And I'll uh, get it open here in the, in the New King James Version as well. So we're just going to continue to run some references here in the New Testament. And uh, we'll see what uh, what uh, further truths the New King James Version uh, does uh, attack. So in Ephesians 4, verse 22, uh, Paul's letter here to the church at Ephesus. And look what he writes here. He says that he put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Now, when he mentions conversation here in verse 22 he's not talking about our speech all right you can understand from the context here that he's talking about our, our, our old manner of life the way we used to live before we were saved 
And again, notice this is this is something that we need to do on a daily basis. Put off the that you put off concerning the former conversation. It says the old man. Why? Remember in um, Corinthians, we looked at that verse where there's that new creature dwelling within us. And behold, all things become new. Another verse, the New King James Version attacks. So you can see this, this truth or this doctrine that it's, that it's attacking here uh, in the scriptures by uh, us looking at uh, three examples that are, that are all similarly uh, connected in, in some way. So it says, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. So we're meant to put off this old man. And what are we meant to do? We're meant to uh, put, on the, put on the new man. And uh, Colossians chapter 3 uh, talks about that as well. But anyway, let's have a look what uh, the uh, New King James Version says. In Ephesians 4 and verse 22, it says that you put off concerning your former con conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. So did you see that clearly? It says here that this old man of ours grows corrupt. So it gives the idea that as you get older, that your flesh becomes more corrupt. Your flesh, it says your old man here grows corrupt, whereas in the authorised version, it says, which is corrupt. <laughs> in the authorised version makes it very clear. It's not, you're not going to, it doesn't grow and comes into becoming more corrupt as you get older. No, it's corrupt from the day that you are born. All right, as soon as you come out of your mother's womb, the book of Psalms says, um, out of the womb speaketh lies. Okay, that reference there is, is found in the book of Psalms. So, uh, and uh, another reference there, it says that the, that the Lord looked down from heaven and to, to see if uh, there was anyone that sought after him. I'm just paraphrasing this here. I believe it's in Psalm 14. And it says that all have gone astray, all are corrupt in their way. They're not growing corrupt uh, in any way. So we, what we have here in the, in the New King James Version is giving the idea that the, the old man just, just grows corrupt as we get older in life. No, that's not the case at all. The scriptures make it very clear that it is corrupt. We won't turn there, but again, I've given you these, these references before. Look at Romans chapter 7 and uh, have a look at the detailed battle that the Apostle Paul had uh, with his flesh, with this old man. This old man fighting with the new man. It wasn't getting worse. It wasn't getting. It wasn't becoming more corrupt. The old man was when he was getting older. No, it's corrupt. As soon as you get saved, you enter that battlefield and you begin to realize that yes, there's a constant battle uh, between the old man and the new man. Uh, Galatians five talks about that uh, uh, as well. So once again, another example where the New King James Version uh, corrupts the Word of God by saying that this old man grows uh, corruptly, um, which grows corrupt. It's complete, uh, utter uh, uh, foolishness uh, indeed. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 1 now. 1 Peter chapter 1. And you can see that with these changes, it's just uh, small, subtle changes. But as a result of those small, subtle changes, it completely changes the, the, the truth behind that particular verse or that particular uh, passage. And uh, let's have a look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and look at look with me here in verse... Uh, well, let me just find my place in the New King James. So, yes, okay, I found my place here. So let's, let's have a look at verse number 6. 1 Peter chapter 1. And look at verse uh, number six. We read this. Wherein ye greatly rejoice. So uh, what are we meant to be rejoicing in? We're meant to be rejoicing because we've got a roof over our head. Are we meant to be rejoicing because we've got uh, food in our fridge? Uh, we're meant to be rejoicing because we've got uh, good health. Are we meant to be rejoicing because we live uh, in a free country in Australia, which some will beg to differ at this time. But can I just say, look, it's, it, it's not as bad as uh, other countries uh, around the world, you know, we can still uh, minister the word of God freely. What are we meant to rejoice in? It says, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Wow. Peter's telling the folk here that, look, 
uh, rejoice, even though you find yourselves in these temptations, even though you find yourselves in these difficulties. You know, that's not always easy to do, is it? You know, that goes contrary to the flesh. There's another example there where you have that, that, that battle with the new man and the old man, because what does the old man want to do? The old man wants to throw in the towel. The old man wants to give up. The old man wants to complain and murmur. But there's that new man inside of us that delights in the law of God. And he says here, we're in. This is a time for us to rejoice. Greatly rejoice, he says, doesn't he? And he gives you the reason here in verse number seven. He says that the trial of your faith, you know, those those difficult times that we go through, that the trial of your faith, he says, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. You know, all the gold uh, in this land is going to perish one day. It says, more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. You know, our faith, you think about those three Hebrews that, that went through the fire there in Daniel chapter 3 for, for memory. You know, their faith was tried. They literally went through burning fire, but they came out on the other end. You know, we're not going to go through burning fire, are we? Even though there are many years ago, and maybe some in other countries today, that are, that are burned at the stake for their faith. But it says here, though the, the ghost tried with fire, it says, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. It will be worth it all at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because then it will be all praise and glory unto him uh, as a result of, of going through uh, those trials. But look what the New King James Version says here in verse number seven. Verse number seven, it says that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, it mentions the genuineness of your faith. No, the authorized version makes it very clear. It says that the trial of your faith, you know, there's a big difference between the word genuineness, if something's real or not. Something's not fake compared to the trial of your faith. You know, we use the word trial today. You know, that's not an old archaic English word. So why would they take out the words uh, trial and replace it with genuineness for? You know, they've just messed with a, with a great promise that we have here in the scriptures. Are they trying to teach in the New King James Version that, uh, or try, trying to sugarcoat the, the, the true Christian life that you're not going to go through any trials that your faith is not going to be tried that at times it's not going to be a difficult in the christian life hence they take out the word trial to try and cover that up and replace it with the word genuineness i don't know why they did that for i don't know their motives uh, behind that but this is a great promise because we our faith if it hasn't been tried it is going to be tried that's a promise from the scriptures but we have a great encouragement there that it can be found unto the praise and honor and glory of the appearing of Jesus Christ. So if your faith is tried, just remember there's a great promise there attached to that, a promise uh, to come. And that is part of the normal Christian life. Don't think it's strange that you go through a trial. But if you went through a trial of your faith when it came to reading the New King James Version, you would think it's strange because they take out the word trial of your faith and replace it with the word genuineness of your faith. Let's have a look what they did in chapter 4. Same book, 1 Peter. Let's have a look what they did here in chapter uh, chapter 4 and verse number 12. Because again, this is talking about uh, the trial of our faith in the authorized version. Let's uh, have a look what it says here. He says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. So he's saying, look, when you experience this trial of your faith, when you experience this fiery trial, don't think that, oh, it's something strange that's happened to me. If we're living according to this book, we are going to expect, whoop, something dropped there, apologize for that. Shouldn't be slamming the table too hard. <laughs> um, if we're going to be living according to this book, then we ought to expect our faith to be trialed and for times for us to go through these fiery trials. Look what he says. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But look what he says in verse 13. But rejoice. <laughs> is Peter insane here? 
How can you rejoice in those fiery trials? Well, he just told us to do it in chapter 1. He's telling us to do it in chapter 4 here. But rejoice. Why? Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Because again, it will be worth it all when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Well, let's have a look what the New King James Version does here in verse number 12. They say... Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happens to you. So look what they've done here. And again, let me stress the subtlety of these translators. So they keep verse number 12 the same. They keep fiery trial the same here in verse number 12. So it lines up with the authorized version. So why on earth did they change it? There in chapter 1, take out trial and replace it with genuineness for. Deceitful, subtlety, just like their father, the devil, the scriptures teach. You know, I'm just quoting scripture. I'm just giving you references to scripture here. But you can see, and again, in the authorized version, you have a, a smooth cross-reference where you can cross-reference these verses with the word trial. You don't get that in the New King James Version because in one spot it says genuineness. The other spot it says trial. Revelation. Revelation chapter 13. Now, as you're turning to Revelation chapter 13, in last week's message, I took us to, let me just give you the exact reference to Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 17. Took you to Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 17, and that talked about the, the idle shepherd. Now, I wanted to get to this reference in our last message, but, but obviously I didn't get to. So I won't go over that information that we looked at that idle shepherd, but just to bring to remembrance in Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 17, we saw in that, uh, that verse that in the authorized version, um, we, we have a verse there describing a, an idle shepherd, I-D-O-L. And uh, we saw from comparing scripture in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that that was a reference to the Antichrist that's going to come into power during that seven year tribulation time here on this earth. But before that takes place, we know from the scriptures that the Lord's going to come back or he's going to come back in the clouds. He's going to take us, those that are in Christ Jesus, out of here before that tribulation time takes place. Whereas in the New King James Version, we notice that they take out the word idle and replace it with the word worthless. And as a result of that, you, uh, you lose the, the cross-reference. And when you read the New King James Version, uh, that particular verse, uh, you cannot identify uh, the Antichrist. Now, let's have a look at uh, Revelation chapter 13 now. And here we are in the midst of that tribulation period. And there's no mistake that the authorized version describes that shepherd as the idol shepherd, I-D-O-L. Let's just uh, pick it up here in chapter 13. Um, chapter 13, any coincidence there in any way? If you, ha if you look at uh, biblical numerology uh, in the scriptures, and number 13 is a, is a reference uh, to uh, rebellion. So is it any, um, any um, coincidence in any way that you have chapter 13 describing, talking about the Antichrist, and uh, that is connected with the rebellion, the number 13 uh, in the scriptures. Anyway, I'll give you another one um, uh, as we move towards the end of this chapter as well. But let's, uh, let's uh, have a look at uh, verse number 2. It says, There was a beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Look what happens here in verse uh, number verse number three. It says that he gets wounded. But look at verse number four. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast. They worship the beast. Who is this beast? This beast is the idol shepherd there in Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 17. I-D-O-L. Notice the uh, reference here to worshipping this beast. They're going to be worshipping an idol. It's not a worthless shepherd. He is the idol shepherd. Again, here are some further true riches in 
the authorized version. It says, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? It says, There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Look at him. It says, And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell uh, in heaven. Now, I want you to, to go down and I want you to uh, have a look at verse uh, verse number 15 because there's going to be an image that's going to be made. There's going to be an image that's going to be made and you can read a little bit about it here in, in, this, in this chapter. I'm just uh, kind of scanning through it here just to give you a little bit of context. And it says in verse 15, He had power to give life unto the image of the beast so there's going to be an image here of the beast. Life's going to be given. So somehow it's going to be made alive. And it says that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Notice that. What sin is going to be uh, predominant during this time? It is going to be idolatry. Notice what it says here. That this image is going to come to life and it's going to be able to speak. And those that do not worship this image, what's going to happen? Death penalty. They are going to be killed. Uh, punishable by death. The idol shepherd. All lines up, doesn't it? Anyway, I'm um, saying all that just to get to our verse here in verse number 16. Look what it says here. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, so that's basically all mankind during this tribulation time, it says to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. As a result of this, verse 17, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now before we have a look at what the New King James Version says, can I just... Uh, uh, say something when it comes to these two verses. There is a, a lot being said at this present time concerning the COVID-19 vaccination that this is the mark of the beast. Well, what saith the scripture? Is the COVID-19 the mark of the beast? Well, the scripture make it very clear to us that this is not the mark of the beast. One reason we can give straight away is because we as the church are still here. This takes place during the tribulation time. So the COVID-19 vaccination is not the mark of the beast. You know, there are, there are people saying that, uh, yes, if you get injected with the vaccination, then you've been injected with the mark of the beast. You know, we'll look at it a little bit closely, but can I just say from the scriptures, uh, that statement is uh, totally and utterly untrue. Not my opinion, but what saith the scriptures? Should you get vaccinated? Should you get? Should you not get vaccinated? That's not my decision to make for, for you. That's not your decision to make for me. That's each and everyone's individual decision to make. Does that make the vaccinated more of a Christian than the unvaccinated or the unvaccinated more of a Christian than the vaccinated? No, it doesn't. That's between you, your doctor, and your God, and the Lord will give you wisdom if you pray about it on what you ought to do in that situation. But if you do get it, can I tell you, it's not the mark of the beast. And if you don't get it, Christian, if you're watching, if you have this idea or this mindset, don't look at those that have got it as, oh, they've got the mark of the beast, because that's not the case at all. Look what it says here. It says here in verse number 17, it says that he, that, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. There you can tell that the COVID-19 vaccination is not the mark of the beast. Because it tells us here it's either the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, verse 18 says, Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6666. Okay, so that's not the COVID-19 um, mark of the beast. That vaccination is not... We make it very clear here, it's 666. Notice verse 18, what's um, 6 plus 6 plus 6? Plus 6. 6 plus 6 is 12, plus another 6 is 18. 666. 6, 6. Any coincidence? No coincidence at all. Anyway, look what the New King James Version says here in this verse. 
in verse number 16. He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and safe to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Now, if you don't look at that closely, you think, well, it matches up with the authorized version. No, it doesn't. Look at it closely. Look how subtle these translators are. The authorized version says to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. What does the New King James Version says to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads? See the difference? They take out um, in and replace it with on. No, there's a big difference, isn't there? You can either have it on the surface or under the surface. And the authorized version makes it very clear that it's going to be in their right hand or in their foreheads, not on their right hand or on their foreheads. Another example where that truth is, uh, where a truth here in the New King James Version uh, is attacked. All right, we've got uh, about 20 more minutes to go. So I will show you some, some other uh, truths now where the, where the New King James Version does uh, uh, attack uh, the authorized version. I'm just going to give you three examples here. Firstly, if you like to turn over to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 8. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 8. And let's have a look at what uh, we're going to see in this uh, example. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and you'll notice as you read the authorized version, a particular word uh, pops up, especially in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. It's, it's found in other places as well, but we'll just look at these, uh, these quick examples here. The word charity. The word charity is used in the authorized version, but you will not find the word charity in the New King James Version. Now, straight away, is the word charity an archaic, outdated English word, or do we use the word charity today? Uh, well, if you go to a, a local car park, it's a shopping center, I'm sure you'll find charity bins, would you not? For uh, the, the, the Smith family or, or the uh, Salvation Army or, or some of those other uh, organizations. So it's not an old English term, it's used today. So why would the New King James Version take out the word charity for? Let me show you some examples of this. Look in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, look at verse number 1. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. What does the New King James Version do? It takes out the word charity and replaces it with the word love. This is what they do in all these examples. They take out the word charity and replace it with the word uh, love. Now, look at chapter, chapter 13. Verse number one, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Again, take out charity and replace it with the word love. They do the same in verse, uh, verse number two uh, as well. And in verse number three, charity is taken out, love is replaced. And if you look at verses four now, for verses four down to verse number eight gives us a definition of what charity is. And you'll, you'll uh, get a good definition, Bible definition of what charity is here in these verses. And it starts off by saying, saying, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. And goes all the way down there to verse number eight. Whereas when you read in the New King James Version, it takes out the word charity and replaces it with the word uh, love. Now, when we read the definition of charity here, we see that charity is a giving love. It's a, it's a giving love and it's a, it's a type of love that we ought to have for each other uh, in, our, in our Christian walk. So again, why would the New King James Version translators mess around with this word for, take it out and replace it with the word love and not find the word charity here in the New King James Version. Not a hard word to understand. If anything, it gives us a greater meaning of this idea of love. It's a love that gives. Didn't, isn't that the type of love that, that God the Father showed mankind? In John 3, 16, where it says, For God so loved the world. How did he prove his love? For God so loved the world that he gave a love that gives. He gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I found this pretty funny. 
Look at First Peter chapter five. First Peter chapter five, because there is a there is a difference here between love and charity, and uh, this should uh, this should make it clear to you here in First Peter chapter five and uh, verse number fourteen. First Peter chapter five and uh, verse number fourteen. Look what it says here. In the authorised version, it says, Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So uh, Peter um, finishes off his letter here and says to greet one another with a kiss of charity. And uh, that type of love that he's talking about is obviously a, a, a love that gives. And a definition there, we looked at it, First Corinthians chapter 13, gives the idea of what this kiss of, of charity is. Now, obviously, we don't don't practice that today in, in our culture, but I just want you to see what the New King James Version says over here. So what they should do, they should take out the word charity and replace it with the word um, love, shouldn't they? Well, let's have a look if they're consistent. As I scan my, scan my eyes down here, yes, they are consistent, but, but look how it reads. It says, greet one another with a kiss of love. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Whereas the authorized version says, greet you one another with a kiss of charity. Now, if you were to greet someone with a kiss of love, what comes to your mind? You know, what comes to, to my mind is um, a kiss of love is, uh, is, uh, is a kiss between uh, a husband and wife, husband and wife uh, relationship. Okay, or a uh, a, a um, uh, grandparents with their uh, grandchildren, or uh, parents with their with their children. Now that that's my idea of what a, what a kiss of love is. The type if I were to <laughs> if I were to kiss one of the brethren, okay, it wouldn't be the same sort of kiss that I would kiss if it were um, uh, a wife or or children uh, or or parents. All right. So you can see how when you read the verse here, greet one another with a kiss of love. Uh, so so it, doesn't make a dis, it doesn't make a difference, does it? Between kiss of charity, that's why charity is important. Makes a difference in your authorised version. It's meant to be charity. It's not meant to be uh, love. So I'll leave that one there before I get myself uh, into trouble and maybe say the wrong thing. Anyway, another word that the New King James Version is guilty of, uh, of changing is uh, the word hell, H-E-L-L. -L. Now, you must ask yourself, why would they change the word hell for? Now, everyone has heard of the word hell. Uh, we use it in our um, speech here in Australia. Uh, in some countries, again, the United States is, is an example, that, that word is actually a, a swear word. And I, I remember um, when I went to America, spent some, some time over there, um, I, I used it not, not as a, well, obviously we use it like what the hell's going on over here or, um, or, 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 or whatever way. And I, I, I think I, I used it in that term, in that way. And, and the look that I got from, from, uh, from uh, someone or, or I can't even remember if I was in a, with a group was, I was just... Uh, they were gobsmacked that I would say the words, the word hell, and I didn't know. I didn't know that they they view it as a, as a swear word over there. So I don't know how they how they um, how they read the authorized version. They come around the word hell, and and maybe they they pause or or maybe they uh, maybe they you know, replace it with the word that's found in the New King. I don't know. But anyway, I, w I was shocked when when um, well, I think they were more shocked than, than I was. But I had to apologize. Oh, sorry, it's just obviously a, a cultural thing. We we use it uh, over here, and, uh, and people use it, and it's not counted as a swear word in, in any way. But I want you to see that it's a word that's known. Okay, it's not a word that needs to be changed. It's not a word that needs to be updated. We know what the word hell is. All right, but why would the New King James Version mess with that word for? And uh, let's just have a look at some of these examples, shall we? Uh, well, firstly, I, um, in my research, I found that the New King James Version, in some instances, they do keep the word hell, but in other examples, they take the word hell out, and uh, they've taken it out at least 20, 22 times. 
They've taken out the word hell 22 times. Who would want to take out the word hell from the Holy Scriptures? You know who would want to take out the word hell and kind of, once again, sugarcoat the word hell and uh, kind of just uh, make it sound not as, uh, as a place of torment and uh, replace it with something else not to scare people. Uh, you know who would do that. Uh, the author of the New King James Version, the spirit behind the New King James Version, uh, the wicked one. So in the Old Testament, the New King James, the word hell is changed to the word Sheol. And we'll look at some examples with that. Whereas in the New Testament, the word hell is translated to the word uh, Hades or Hades, however you want to, des to describe the thing. So you can really um, uh, imagine uh, saying uh, here in Australia, what the Hades is going on over here? And what the hell is going on over here? Okay, everyone knows that. Now, if you say Hades, uh, people will look at you and think, what on earth is he saying? Uh, what language is he speaking? In actual fact, that's actually untranslated here in the New King James Version. That's actually a, a Greek word, uh, just like Sheol there in the in the Old Testament. So anyway, Sheol uh, describes uh, the grave there in the uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, that's why they were, use the word Sheol. Whereas then in the New Testament, Hades. Well, you know what Hades is if you if you um, understand Greek mythology in, in any way. That's the that's the name for the for the underworld, isn't it? Is there an underworld when it comes to to the to the to the holy scriptures? No, there's no uh, underworld. All right, so let, let's just look at some of these uh, examples, shall we? And I've got a number written down here, so again, I might not be able to get through. Uh, we'll just go through what we can. Psalm 18, firstly. Psalm 18, and let's have a look at look at verse number five. Psalm 18, Psalm 18, and in the authorised version, we read, The sorrows of hell can pass me about, the snares of death uh, prevented me. This is a Psalm of David, and he says, The sorrows of hell can pass me about. What does the New King James Version says? say? It says here, The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. So there it is. They replaced the word hell with Sheol, and uh, as a result of doing that, what on earth is Sheol? Why not just leave it as it is? It's, the problem is they, they don't understand the context of what's going on, so as well as not understanding what's being written here, they feel that they need to remove the word hell and replace it with the word uh, Sheol. All right, let's have a look at uh, another example, Isaiah chapter 5. Interesting uh, to know as well that the Jehovah's Witnesses they don't believe in a literal place called hell either. They believe it's just the, just the grave. Funny that, isn't it? Funny how that lines up with the New King James Version. Same spirit behind the New King James Version is involved in the cult of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Birds of a feather flock together, they say. Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5, and let's look at verse number 14. Isaiah 5 and verse 14, it says, uh, let's look at 13. Therefore, my people are gone in captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp. And he that rejoices shall descend into it. Talking about a literal hell. What does the New King James Version do here in this verse? In verse 14, it says, Therefore, Sheol has enlarged itself. Sheol has enlarged itself. No, it's called hell. H-E-L-L, -L, not Sheol. Let's look at chapter 14 of Isaiah. Another example. Isaiah chapter 14. And look at verses 13 to 15. This one's an interesting one, isn't it? Because this is in reference to the fall of Lucifer. So again, he's going to want to cover his tracks here in this passage, is he not? So let's have a look what it says here in verse number 12, Isaiah 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I'll ascend into heaven. I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north. 
Uh, he says, I'll ascend uh, above the heights of the clouds. I'll be uh, like the Most High. Verse 15, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pits. There's the reference there to Satan, to Lucifer. And uh, the Lord says, no, you're going to be brought down to where? Brought down to hell. What does the New King James Version says? It says in verse 15, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol. You shall be brought down to the grave. Is Satan, was Satan brought down to the grave or was Satan brought down to hell? He was brought down to hell. You know, he was not brought down to the grave. All right. Let's look at one more example because we touched on this example in our last uh, last message. And that example is found in the book of, uh, book of Jonah. <clears throat> when we looked at the, the whale, if you recall... So if you go back there to Jonah, and let me just give this one to you. Jonah chapter 2. Have a look at uh, verses. Um, I thought it, yes, it would help if I'm in the right book, wouldn't it? I find myself in the book of Joel. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Isn't there, isn't there, that TV ad should have gone to Specsavers? <laughs> Anyway, the book of Jonah, this looks a lot better now. All right, Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. What does the New King James Version says? It says, out of the belly of Sheol I cried. Now, there's a great teaching here, which the New King James translators had no idea about, because that's the reason why they replaced the word hell and uh, decided to insert Sheol instead. Now, <clears throat> we won't get into this teaching because it's teaching in and of itself, but Jonah, he did not go down to the grave here in this passage. When he says, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, yes, he was actually in hell or a part of him was actually in hell you know there's no affliction there in the grave when you're in the grave you're dead you're gone you've got no life but in hell it's a different story and it's interesting that the lord jesus christ used this example there in the book of matthew when those pharisees wanted a sign because the lord jesus christ yes he died we know that his spirit he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. His spirit went back to the Father. We know his body went to the grave because he was uh, buried three days and three nights. But where did his soul go when he died on the cross? His spirit went to the Father. His body went to the grave. Where did his soul go? On the cross he said, I thirst. What did that rich man say there in Luke chapter 16 about being in a place called hell? being in torments we'll get to that in a minute like i said that's a message in and of itself okay but you only get that from the authorized version you don't find that in the new king james version all right let's have a look at matthew let's look at uh, matthew chapter 16 now so in the old testament there they change it to the word sheol let's have a look what they do here in the new testament i've already told you that they change it with the word hades and uh what in Hades are they doing? <laughs> Matthew chapter 16, and look at verse number 18. Authorized version says unto Peter, Jesus Christ speaking, and I will say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There are gates in hell. Yes, there are gates in hell. All right. Gates in hell shall not prevail against it. What does the New King James Version say? It says, and also I say to you that you are Peter on this rock. I'll build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. See, take out the word hell and replace it with Hades. So according to the New King James Version, if someone who dies, where are they going to go, Mr. Translator? Oh, they're going to go to Hades, are they? No, the authorized version makes it very clear. They're going to go to hell. H-E-L-L, -L, not Hades, H-A-D-E-S, however you want to describe that word. This is the example I wanted to show you, Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, and 
look with me at this account because this is the account of that rich man that finds himself um, in hell. And let's have a look what the authorized version says and then let's have a look what the New King James version says. Luke chapter 16 and let's have a look at this. Verse 22 it says, came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels in Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. So this uh, rich man, it says that he was buried, whereas the beggar went to Abraham's bosom. Look at verse 23, talking about the rich man and in where? And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. It says, he seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Verse 24 Look what he says. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in what? In water. What did Jesus Christ say on the cross? I thirst. Why would Jesus Christ say, I thirst? Could it be that his soul went to this place? It says, and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. He's being tormented in where? He's being tormented in a place called hell. What does the New King James Version do here in verse number 23? It says, and being in torments in Hades. Being in torments in Hades. No, being in torments in hell. Now, again, this is a study in and of itself, but let me just uh, make it clear to you here. In the Old Testament, uh, before the Lord Jesus Christ uh, died and rose again from the dead, people went to two different places. They either went to a place called hell that we read about here, or they went to a place that we read here called Abraham's bosom. A place of Abraham's bosom here, notice that um, Abraham's bosom is a place of comfort. Look at verse 25. Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in the lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. So there was a place of comfort, there was a place of torment. That place of comfort was known as Abraham's bosom, was known as paradise according to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. There was also another portion of that part, uh, sorry, Abraham's bosom, there's also another portion there, a great gulf fixed, separated Abraham's bosom from a place called hell. And that place was a place of torment. We can see this particular individual, this rich man, being a place called torment where he thirsted, where he was um, uh, in pain and where he was uh, in suffering. That's where people went before Christ died and rose again from the dead. Those uh, righteous to Abraham's bosom, those unrighteous to a place called hell. The Lord Jesus Christ rose, uh, died, rose again from the dead. As a result of that, um, the, again, I'm going pretty quick with this. this is probably, you've probably never heard of this stuff before, but the Lord Jesus Christ came down to this uh, area here and uh, led captivity captive, Ephesians chapter 4, took those saints there in Abraham's bosom up into heaven. And as a result of that, all that part now, all that area now is now become hell. And so when someone dies today, those that are in Christ, they don't go to Abraham's bosom. They go straight up into heaven to be absent from the body, is to be present with the Lord. But those that reject Christ here in this life, they don't go up to heaven. They don't go to Abraham's bosom, but they go to a place called hell. And it's not called Hades, it's called hell, just like the authorized version uh, states. All right, I'm going to leave it there. I know some of that stuff at the end there, um, not necessarily to do with uh, our study on the attacks of the Holy Scriptures, but uh, it just gives you further um, uh, evidence to show that these truths that the New King James Version attack in the authorized version are very serious. These are Bible truths that you're not going to find in the New King James Version if you read Sheol and Hades in this book instead of reading hell as it's meant to be here in the Authorized Version. All right, I'll leave that uh, leave that thought there. I've got a couple of more examples to show you, but uh, I believe next Sunday I'm going to be preaching down here in, in Sydney. So Lord willing, I'll be able to upload that message. And then after that, we'll get back to continuing to look at the attacks on the Holy Scriptures when it comes to the New King James Version.